Thanks, Shannon. Uh, my name is Jessica Yabsley. I'm with the Data Coalition. Uh, our coalition was founded in 2012. Uh, we are the first and only US uh, trade association dedicated to uh, advocating for the publication of government information in an open, standardized format. Uh, we currently represent 36 uh, tech and consulting firms, uh, 10 of which are tech startups that have been founded in the last 10 years. Uh, the others are um, public sector companies, uh, which roughly employ over 200,000 Americans. Uh, our members also obviously support our mission. Uh, the coalition advocates for the proposal of, uh, for legislative proposals that modernize Congress. Uh, we can get into those a little bit more. Uh, but what we've been advocating uh, for for the last three years, uh, the Data Act, which some of you may be familiar with, we strong, strongly supported the passage of that uh, first open data law uh, that was sort of championed by Senator Warner and Representative Issa. Uh, and then just a week ago, uh, we marked the first uh, milestone, which Dave can really get into. Uh, so uh, that really puts together um, basically for the first time one open data set that sort of brings together financial award information uh, and it potentially has the has the um, ability to be the most valuable data set in the world and I encourage you all to go check it out at beta.usaspending.gov and have a play around with it. All right, so Dave. Hey, I'm Dave. Uh, I am the executive director of 18F. Uh, I'm also the assistant commissioner for acquisitions within the office of acquisitions within the technology transformation service within the general services administration. Um, and uh, I, I'm here representing uh, GSA. Uh, we were proud to partner with Treasury uh, and partner with OMB to uh, work on the Data Act implementation. Uh, as Jessica said, it went live last week at beta.usaspending.gov. Uh, it also speaks to some of the work that we uh, we love to do at 18F, which is to help make uh, make data more available to the public, to be really uh, to have a transparent government, um, and to work with our agency partners to help meet their mission. Um, today, we're going to be talking a little bit about procurement. Um, my my passion uh, coming into the federal government was to make procurement joyful, um, and we've we've had a lot of uh, interesting experiments that we've been running over the years uh, to to get there. Um, but really what, what drives uh, a lot of the work that I do and that the team does is we want to have a responsive government uh, that meets the needs of its, uh, the American public uh, and making sure that uh, government service, I, I love this catchphrase, somebody, uh, some, an engineer on our team uh, described this as we want to make, uh, make go uh, good enough for government work, high praise. Um, and that's, that's some of the work that we are trying to do at 18F. All right, Ken. Uh, my name is Ken Ward. I'm the CEO of Fireside 21. We make software tools for elected officials, and we are uh, endeavor to help them be better elected officials. Um, all of our customers right now are in the house, and so we've been working for nearly 10 years now as Fireside 21, um, helping our customers do anything from get online and communicate better publicly with constituents, and then behind the scenes have tools that help support engagement and responding to constituents and making sense of all of the letters and calls and emails that they get. Um, in the house, we've got about 160 customers using our software, um, and we've been growing over the last decade or so here um, to provide, you know, an alternative to the, the big behemoth incumbent provider who nobody seems to like. Um, so, um, our, our, you know, on the panel here, we have a little bit more of a legislative branch uh, angle, so happy to, happy to help answer those questions. Perfect, and I'll give a little bit of background on myself. So my name is Shannon Sarton. I work for the United States Digital Service. Um, I started off my career as a contracting officer for Indian Health Service before moving to private industry, um, and then coming back after swearing I would never be a Fed again um, to try to work on basically Dave's mission of making procurement joyful. Um, we have not succeeded yet, which is why we are still here and hoping that all of you will kind of join us on that journey and be inspired by some of these conversations. So. Um, I have a couple questions that I was going to ask panelists. The format here is basically 30 minutes of my asking them questions, and then we'll open the floor to all of you. So be thinking about the questions that you might have. Um, so one of the first questions that I have, which I'm going to initially direct at Dave, is around the current state of transformation regarding um, IT-specific procurement. And could you just provide us some insight on what that looks like and maybe some forethought on what might be coming down the pipeline? Yeah. Um, so. Uh let just sort of set the stage, take a step back, uh, and I'll talk about the federal context, uh, the executive context, and then 
the legislative context we can talk about separately. Um, the, you know, the, the federal government spends a lot on IT, right? We spend $80 billion a year on unclassified IT spending, and that probably understates it. Uh, additionally, the federal government spends somewhere between 50 to 100 million or billion every year. Don't, nobody really knows the exact number uh, for IT spending at the state and local level uh, for federal programs. So that's like a lot of money, uh, 100, anywhere between like 100 to 150 billion dollars a year in IT spending from the federal government. That's a that's a ton. You can actually track now a lot of it on so USA spending. Say, go check it out. Um, the uh, uh, but but the thing is that you know nobody really associates the federal government with having gotten a lot of value for that hundred uh, plus billion dollars in IT spending, um, and so in the last uh, really about the last uh, I mean this is an ongoing effort to improve uh, improve the, the way the government purchases IT and, and software, um, but really in the last uh, half decade last five years or so um, there's been a real emphasis on trying to think about new and innovative ways of doing procurement in the federal federal space. Um, and that looks, uh, that looks a lot like what you actually heard about in the mid-1990s, uh, which is to not buy big monolithic systems that fail, um, but instead to go through things iteratively, uh, build based on what on real users' needs are, uh, prototype, have things fail, improve, do it again, improve, 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 until you finally get a product that you're happy with, and then don't stop, keep improving that product until you actually get something that uh, continues to meet your users' needs. Um, and what we've been working on, the federal government and USDS was an early leader with things like the Tech FAR, uh, partnering with OMB uh, and the Office of Federal Procurement Policy and other parts of GSA and, and leadership there. Um, we're really trying to think through how can we implement a more modular approach to contracting? Um, how can we take advantage of the existing commercial solutions that are out there? We don't need to build our own cloud. Turns out there are already cloud providers that are out there. I don't know, um, one or two that are on the, on the, on the uh, wall. Um, we can think about how uh, we can take advantage of you know, commercially available software as a service solutions, uh, infrastructure as a service solutions, uh, and, and custom builds when, when appropriate, um, and thinking about taking some of the best concepts in private sector and bringing them into the government. Um, it's, not, uh, it's not an easy task. The federal acquisition regulations are, are voluminous, uh, but they're not impossible. There are ways that we can be creative and work sort of collaboratively uh, in governments to, to get better outcomes. And, I would say, I used to describe this as like, I have, I have two kids. When they started walking, um, they would sort of like crawl on the, uh, you know, on the, on the chairs. They would sort of like, like couch surf, you know? That's kind of where I feel like the government is. We're like couch surfing right now. Um, but soon we're gonna start walking and then we're gonna start running and then we're gonna be in a good place. Perfect, Ken or Jessica, do you wanna add anything to that? Well, I, I can just offer that the, the legislative branch has its own unique procurement structure. As a matter of fact, the House and the Senate have their own independent of one another. So a lot of the, you know, when you hear people say that the government is kind of behind the private sector, well, there's a lot of advances that are happening in the executive branch going in the right direction, but the legislative branch is another step or two or three behind, unfortunately. So um, it's great to see whether it's flexibility with infrastructure or flexibility with innovation that's, that, that's being pushed in the executive branch. Um, but that kind of same change and, and momentum of movement hasn't quite come down to the legislative branch yet. One other thing I just add is um, we're at the Data Coalition, we're a strong advocate for the use of non-proprietary identifiers. Uh, so I think as long as uh, contractors are sort of locked in proprietary identifying structures, uh, it just um, doesn't allow contracting data to be completely open and transparent. Yeah, perfect. So I think segueing into a different piece of this, which would be talking about potential legislative changes and or uh, bills that might already be in existence that you guys want to talk to about positive impacts that that may have on procurement kind of on both sides of the fence. Jessica, do you want to talk about that one first? Sure. Um, so obviously we started to talk about the Data Act uh, and obviously that came into effect last week. Uh, and I think that really sets a real like transformation for federal government collecting uh, collecting federal spending information, and uh, I think the Data Act uh, allows or well, it first requires a standardization and publishing of the information in a single data set. But I think the data set um, now it's accessible to everyone via an API. Uh, it doesn't just allow the oracles and Amazons of the world to access this. It now sort of levels the playing field and lets everyone sort of uh, get in there and build sort of analytic platforms and insights that really um, shows value to not only like 
to citizens. Right, definitely. And Dave, I don't know if you want to touch more on the Data Act or I think an important topic here that I know Ken has kind of felt the pain of is what it's like to be a small business or a new business in this space and not have access to information about where spending is going, um, ways to kind of break through from a sales perspective. Um, so if either of you want to comment on that piece of that, I think that that's a great opportunity for us to talk about. Well, yeah, I can just offer that, you know, all of these structures, even though they're getting better, they're they're huge. It's so hard to understand in a lot of ways. You know, what we do on Capitol Hill, we're kind of like a little specialist. And what you guys do in the executive branch is so foreign to me, even still. We're, you know, a government technology provider. And um, so, yeah, there's just a high threshold of, of requirements for a company like Fireside or other startups to have smart people, civic-minded people trying to make things better. Um, there's still just a high threshold to get through. And, you know, we've had to you know, employ uh, and 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 um, spend money on consultants who are like, because it's so obtuse. Like they're experts at winning government contracts, and it's all about how do you write this proposal in the right way. That's the old way, but um, it's still kind of the current way for us in the the legislative branch. It's still definitely the current way on. Uh, on our side as well. And I think Dave can talk a little bit about some of their experiences at 18F and trying to reform procurement and look at it differently. And maybe there's some takeaways here um, for potential adoption. Yeah, I mean, the, at, at the high level, the, the reality is that the government is a really difficult customer. Um, and we, we're a difficult customer for a, a, a variety of reasons. One, we, we imagine ourselves as different from the private sector in many ways that we're not. Um, we think that we cannot take advantage of commercial solutions because, you know, you can throw in everything you want from security to, you know, accessibility to uh, to service availability. I mean, you know, we, we're asking for higher levels of service availability than than you'd expect from from Google. Right. Like that. That's that's not right. Um, and so and it might be right for certain applications, but certainly not all of the applications. Um, and I think part of what we uh, what we struggle with as, as a government is understanding what our requirements really are. And I'm going to and when I say requirements, um, I actually don't mean sort of what you traditionally would expect is like this giant requirements matrix. You know, you imagine every possible thing that you'd ever maybe need in the next 10 years because you definitely need to buy that up front. Uh, that is the actually the normal way the government buys things. Uh, my guess is that if you've never sold to the government, that sounds crazy to you. Uh, if you have sold to the government, that's crazy to you. Uh, and if you're in government, it's still crazy, but that's how we do it. Um, and what we've discovered is that actually by flipping that on its head, instead of saying, you know, tell me everything that you need to know in the next 10 years and say, what do I need right now? Just tell me what I need today. Um, and defining that really uh, in a thoughtful way and asking industry, you know, what, what, what do you do? <laughs> like, how do you solve this particular problem? Having that dialogue with industry is actually a much healthier way of doing business. Um, and it also gets you better results um, because, as it turns out, industry understands government better than sometimes government understands itself. Uh, and, uh, and it can also say, you know what, you don't need this widget or you don't need this type of thing. We've got something that will get you most of the way there. And you go, that, that's actually what, that's, that's what I'm looking for. Um, and so um, the, you know, to sort of to round it out from a small business perspective, when you're trying to work with government, you go, there's no way that I can meet that huge list of requirements. It's just impossible. Um, but if you have if you have partners within government who are open to saying, "Tell me what you can provide. This is my problem," and then in, uh, and then a small business can say, "Yeah, I can take on that risk, and I can work with a with, with a government in this particular way." Um, and the government is open to being a partner in that in that regard. We can actually start to see some real uh, real partnership and uh, and improvement. Yeah, I definitely think improving realistic requirements. I just made a note that one of my one of the first procurements that I work on, worked on after coming back from US Digital Service, they told me they had to have a five nines uptime. And I laughed. And I was like, your current legacy system has like 74%. I'm unclear how we're jumping to five nines. But they tried to. And I found it really interesting. So one of the questions that I wanted to pass over to Ken was about risk assessment and security. And I think that there are perceptions around what we need in order to be secure from a system perspective. Um, that make it very difficult for a small company like yours to bid on things. And I'd love it if we could just elaborate on that a little. Um, yeah, well, certainly um, kind of risk assessment and security vulnerabilities are super visible today in the news every single day. And for a company like Fireside, you know, we've had to come up to speed you know, very quickly in some of these things to try to compete um, for new contracts. 
and um, it's a high threshold. So just like the, you know, we've, we've filled in the requirements matrix and we said, why are they specifying this with such a level of detail and things like that. But even beyond that, you know, the, the, the standards that are public are good, but they're still not super accessible in, uh, to, a, to a, a startup, for example. Um, so almost like more transparency and more, um, you know, open sourcing of the requirements, which are really just documentation. It's really, if, if, you, if you're going to get a contract, you need to document certain processes and certain procedures that are related to security. It's, it's actually not that complicated, but if you don't have it, if you don't understand it, it's a huge hurdle to overcome. And then a lot of the way these procurements work, it's like, you, here's a deadline, and it's, you win or you lose. And so you, you put together this whole package and you do your best effort and then you, maybe it just wasn't quite good enough. Um, and so that can be really frustrating and we certainly, um, we certainly experienced that. So, um, it, you know, the, the, the matrix of requirements is, is one thing, but emerging, I think, in big ways, kind of security thresholds. Yeah, Dave, do you want to touch on this as well from kind of an open source perspective? Ken and I had a conversation earlier where we were just talking about fears around open source and um, maybe some of those have been mitigated to some degree at different agencies, not entirely, but I think that that maybe remains a little bit more between the House and Senate. And so if you want to talk a little bit about the ways we've moved forward there. Sure. I mean, open source, uh, so 18F in particular is a uh, open source by default organization. So all of our all of our source code is made available uh, by default from day one uh, on 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 the internet. Um, and open source is, is basically, uh, we found that to be a better way of doing business um, for a variety of reasons, even including from a security perspective. Um, so a lot of people assume that, for, f I, I, and this is still actually a little bit strange to me, that open source is somehow less secure. Uh, in, pra in practice, uh, open source drives the internet. It, it is what the internet actually operates on. Uh, I, there was this famous apocryphal story about how in the military, you know, the Department of Defense has been using open source for a very long time. Uh, and I had been told, okay, well, we can't use open source. And then you'd look in the jets and the jets were using, you know, open source software on the jets. And you're going, well, we probably want the same thing that we have there as that we have actually on the base. Um, and, you know, Linux, open source. It drives the majority of the internet. Most of the websites in the world are run on a lamp stack. That's open source. SQLite, built for the Navy, open source. Um, you know, the uh, open source is like a dominant thing in, in the government. And what we've actually started to see is that open source creates opportunities both for industry to participate more, more broadly and frankly, uh, provides a more secure internet. So I'm, I'm really proud of this. Uh, last week, uh, TTS awarded a, a bug bounty program uh, to uh, to basically in encourage security researchers to provide uh, vulnerability disclosures to uh, GSA. Um, that only exists when you have an open source uh, culture uh, and basically encouraging uh, security researchers to look through our code and identify vulnerabilities and help us uh, help us close them. Um, you can't encourage that level of uh, participa uh, participation with industry and, and indiv independent security researchers without open source. And then on the flip, uh, now vendors, when they're trying to decide whether to participate and get involved with an 18F project, they can inspect our code, uh, and they can evaluate their own level of risk. Do I know how to write in Python? Yes or no? I now know that this is a Python stack. Uh, do, I, do I want to actually inherit all of the, uh, the technical debt here? Can I improve that product? You can make those sort of risk determinations uh, in a more uh, transparent way, and that allows you to have more effective bid. Yeah, that's super helpful. Um, I think one of the other things that I would flag as well from the um, open source side is, are, is there legislation around, oh, like I'm genuinely asking yeah. this, yeah. <laughs> is there legislation around open source? I know that OMB has got some initiatives that I know about, but I'm unclear about even things that may impact yeah. um, the House or Senate. Yeah, uh, so this is a, the op open source is uh, it's not legally required. Uh, OMB has put out a, mem a memorandum basically encouraging a certain amount of open source, and there's a 20% requirement that's applicable to federal agencies. Um, Congress not that long ago prohibited open source, uh, and then in the last couple of years they actually uh, revised their policy to say that open source is not only available but encouraged, um, which is great because a lot of their websites use web, uh, WordPress and other uh, and, and Drupal and, and other. Uh, other open source stacks. Um, so uh, I don't, I'm not aware of any legislation um, uh, other than, you know, the, 
the fact that it is widely used now in both uh, the legislative side and the executive side. Right, and Ken, are you seeing improvements with, with, I know that we talked about it earlier, that it's not quite there, but are you seeing some improvements in movement with open source? Um, yeah, definitely. I mean, in a, in a broader technology perspective, I mean, open source technologies and open source stacks is, is what facilitates this rapid innovation that's, and, and so having it being limited, um, which is different now, I think the, the House is now allowing it, uh, the Senate's a little different, but um, before that, it was like, oh, we've built this technology and now we have these limitations that now we're approved provider to provide this service to the people that we're trying to help, and then we have these like handcuffs. You can't, you can't. It makes it harder to innovate once you're in the door um, of actually providing these services. So um, the House, I think, deserves a lot of credit for moving the policy forward, and it's not actually require any legislation. The CAO or the, the uh, the chief administrative officer and the um, committee in House administration, they have authority to make these rules. Um, and on the Senate side, it would be the sergeant at arms who you can call to uh, tell to uh, change things a little bit. So is that is there still a policy prohibiting open source at the Senate? <clears throat> um, yeah, all everything in the Senate is very closed, um, and they they have some requirements around. Um, I, I'm looking at Josh here, who did wrote some procurement stuff, but. Um, uh, around supported supported platforms and so open source some open source platforms by definition don't have an originating supporting company or corporation and so that that flags things and disqualifies uh, fireside in one in, in one instance for sure fascinating um, all right so one of the other things that we wanted to talk about as far as um, openness is concerned and definitely talking a little bit more about open data. So you had this concept of insider knowledge for the possibility of doing business with the government. We talked about how difficult it is for a small business to come in. Um, so Jessica, you know, I mean, you guys have worked a lot on open data for spending and talking about um, maybe different opportunities that that's opening up for businesses and the way that we can um, potentially kind of put a little bit more volume behind that or any ways that you could see improvements. Sure. I mean, Last, oh, I think it was April, we hosted, um, and actually Dave was there, we hosted a hackathon um, and we actually got um, some participants, over 25 partic hackers uh, joined and uh, they were there just for 30 hours using, sorry, go back two steps, they were using uh, Daydrack data, um, I think five agencies had reported and they were using live agency data and they just spent 30 hours and the platforms that they were able to come up with and the solutions in just 30 hours were, I mean, Amazing what we've never been able to see, like overlaying census data and seeing where educate, like educational outcomes are happening across the United States. Uh, so I suppose obviously Treasury's done the first step and now the door's wide open for uh, companies to come in and add that, se that second and third layer of value uh, to this brand new data set. And I think it's really exciting opportunities. Right, and Dave, I know that you guys used your um I can't remember. There were some data sets. Maybe it was FDA for the BPA that were used. Yeah. yeah if you want to talk about that experience, that's really cool. So uh, we created this thing called the Agile BPA. It's an uh, Agile Blanket Purchase Agreement. Uh, the really innovative thing there is that for the first time that we knew of in government, uh, we never asked for paper. Uh, we asked for a prototype and price. Uh, and we selected a vendor pool of uh, potential future vendors uh, to work with 18F based on that prototype and, and and price, and you might say, well, how did you make sure that they were all on an even playing field? Well, we used a single set of data uh, from the Federal Drug Administration, Food and Drug Administration, uh, FDA, uh, and uh, uh, and basically Open FDA was the API, and we said, you know, use this API and build an awesome prototype from it. Um, what was interesting about that is you could definitely, there was, some, there was some sort of sorting that happened by demanding that they use an API, so some agencies are like, can I have it on a CD? Uh, that, that was an actual quest question that we got. Can I have, can I have uh, the API to CD-ROM? And we're like, nope, you're eliminated. Um, <laughs> sorry, um, it's not going to work out. Um, but we, uh, the good thing is that we had a lot of uh, excellent vendors uh, who were able to part uh, participate, uh, and um, that that's uh, that's been extraordinary. And you know, one of the things that's been great too about uh, about data, uh, the federal government's posture toward open data is that it's really been 
Uh, it's, a, it's, it's an actually an easier way for government to exchange data. When you talk to CIOs and you talk to agency partners, one of the biggest challenges that they have is just data exchange, even internally, is hard. Um, but by focusing on having a, by really focusing on publishing your data in an open format and an open way, uh, using you know APIs or bulk data or whatever it might be that's appropriate for that particular agency, you can get out of the old patterns of ETL and sort of think about actually publishing in a more modern way so that you can exchange data more effectively. Um, and you know, I imagine that, you know, I, I'm going to put this out there. I've already told Congress this at one point in time. They need, like, a flag API. So if you want to, like, if you want to request a flag, you just, like, send a post request to the API and then you need a flag. That seems like a, a natural way of doing service delivery. Um, and there are other things that Congress could be thinking about. Uh, and certainly the federal government can be thinking about is using data both internally and externally and web services in that way. Right, definitely. And I think Dave knows this, but I actually was working for a company that bid on the BPA. And I remember afterwards going back and looking at what we had done with the data set versus what other people had done. And it was really clear that everybody had a different interpretation of what would be a great thing to present to the government. Um, and it's been uh, doing prototyping, using open data sets has been something that we've been using at US Digital Service a lot to try and encourage agencies to basically take a show me, don't tell me approach to procurement. Um, I was actually interested, Ken, if you would be willing to describe a little bit of the process of what it looks like to sell to um, either the House or Senate or both, um, and what the nuances around that process are, and what it would take if I was a new business wanting to do business in there. Yeah, opening up some some wounds here, but um, so we, we've been in the House for you know over ten years, and so we had a similar process there, where it's you know you get this big stack of paper, and and you know the way that we all would buy something is let's try it out, or let's ask a let's ask a friend if they have a what 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 experience they have with it, and that's just not how it works at all. You know, as a matter of fact, I can't I can't say who our customers are. They can't tell you either. They can't endorse Fireside as a, a federal elected official. So. Maybe the best the best way to buy something is explicitly prohibited, but yeah, it's just you know typically a huge RFP with a whole bunch of government speak that you have to drill through and write a response to and provide attachments and addendums and um, you know it's it's a months long process to just build a proposed response. I don't know if that's what you're asking for. Yeah, no, definitely. And I guess I would be curious too for those proposals. Have you ever? Has anybody at the House or Senate ever attempted to do some sort of prototyping exercise or something a little bit more modern for the procurements? Uh, I, I guess I can give some credit to the House folks. They, they're, they're trying to do things differently on the on, with open source and, and things like that. Um, but some of the core things that we do um, haven't really been modernized. You know, um, we wait around for it to open up for a short window of time, and then it disappears and doesn't come back for years and years and years. Um, so, you know, definitely bringing in more open source technologies has, has happened in the house and that's kind of like shortcutted or bypassed the traditional procurement process. But once you get into that federal or the, the legislative procurement process, it's pretty dense. Perfect. And I heard you say that sometimes it comes out and then won't come back for a few years. So it's, <laughs> what's competition like? Oh yeah. So all of this is not winning any money like um so, so i should say all of this process that i've been describing is really just to get like kind of like a fishing license to go throw your um, lure out there to try to then win so if you're asking about winning business it's all of this procurement and then convincing the actual true customer that you have a solution that can deliver value to them um so yeah yeah, no, that's perfect. So I guess my next question <laughs> would be, though, so you've clearly made this your business model, right, to yeah. specifically do business here. Are there other small businesses that are like yours, or is this predominantly dominated by large companies? I mean, it's a very yeah. cost-heavy so, so process. All of this totally favors these big behemoths that you hear about, healthcare.gov disaster kind of type companies. Um, and so, but then on the other end of the spectrum, there are some companies like Fireside, you know, like we're a purpose-driven company or we're, we're here you know, to steal from The Bachelor. We're here for the right reasons, right? And um, Good. we're here for the right reasons. And, and there, are, there are others in this room and in D.C. who are trying to solve these problems and fighting the good fight. But, um, you know, I guess we can come together and collaborate more or, or keep railing on the powers that be to be more open and try to adopt things from the executive side into the legislative side. 
Right, definitely. And I think, you know, one of the things that at U.S. Digital Service we talk about a lot is that we're not out to take business away from large companies. We just want products delivered right. And if a large company wants to adopt agile methodologies or use human-centered design, we encourage that 100%. And I think that's what is really interesting for us is that we do have the ability to drive a lot of that through competition and through reoccurring procurements or to say that we only have a six-month period of performance on different contracts. So it's interesting to hear about how different it is just from that perspective. Competition really can drive the adoption of new technology because without that, I think it's next to impossible for a new business to identify this as a market they even want to break into. And I'd be remiss if I didn't note that we've had, at 18 f we've had extraordinary partners, both large and small, largely because we've been working with them in partnership and sort of not expecting them to be unreasonable in the delivery, but actually trying to ask them to participate like they would in the private sector. Yeah, definitely. Um, so we're at about 15 minutes now. The clock wasn't on earlier, so I'm hoping it's right. <laughs> okay, perfect. So I'm going to open it up for questions. Does anybody have any about procurement, about technology, about any of us, the things we're working on? We have a on? question in the back. Hey, so um, Jessica, Dave, congratulations on the launch of data.usaspending.gov. Huge Thank Huge you. work. Oh, uh, we should all really. It's, it's actually yes. not me. It's Treasury, Treasury. Caitlin Devine, Becky yeah. Sweeter, and others. Yeah. Yeah. Christina Ho. You know she's not here, but a huge yep. shout out to her. Yep. Uh, so the question that I have is if you could all talk about the tension between um, procurement and contracting and having in house talent inside the government. Sure. I'll take that. Uh, so actually, the Data Act is a great example of where that tension didn't really exist. Um, so um, I'm really proud of this story. So when uh, 18F was involved about a year and a half ago, um, we initially developed a prototype that we presented to, to Treasury, um, and it was literally a prototype. It was written in a weekend. It was uh, presented. It was a, it was, you'll appreciate this since you write in Python, Josh. Uh, it was a pandas script uh, that was able to take SBA data and, demonst and show it uh, to, to Treasury and say, this, this concept of a Data Act broker can work, but we're not going to build it for you. Uh, you're going. You're going to either build it yourself. They're like, oh, we don't have any people to build it. So we're like, we're going to we're going to contract to industry, um, and so we uh, helped them uh, draft a procurement. Uh, they got a contractor within a matter of weeks, really, uh, and that that vendor uh, partnership basically built over the next year and a half what you now see uh, as the Data Act broker and USA uh, Beta USA Spending Deck of. Um, and that was, you know, there were a few folks from 18F who were riding alongside and sort of helping as partners with Treasury and with the vendor team. Um, but, you know, we worked with, uh, it was Kearney Booz was the vendor that we worked with, um, and they were ex exceptional uh, in delivering that product. So uh, this was not an example of where it was tension. It was actually the sort of uh, if uh, the, the partnership that you'd want to see more government of doing. Yeah, and I'll touch on this a little bit as well. So I, U.S. Digital Service, um, we have a lot of engineers that come in and I think anticipate and expect to be doing actual programming and end up not. Um, but it's interesting to watch the dynamic between the contracts that they take over and the technical talent that comes in under those contracts. Um, and we run into questions a lot about can they just jump in and start writing code on a specific contract and the answer is typically, I think we've got an exception to this like once, is typically no because it would potentially um, cause some issues for the contractor or their actual delivery. So, you know, it's, it's also interesting to talk about the procurement methodologies that we want to be using more of that tend to be um, a little bit heavier from the uh, human capital perspective. So there needs to be more federal employees who have technical knowledge to evaluate a technical contractor. Uh, you know, you can't tell somebody to submit to you their code base, but actually not have somebody who can review it. So that's an amazing thing that 18F has been uh, working with agencies to provide, which is that support around how to get and identify great contractors. Yeah, we don't have too much direct visibility into this, but there there isn't yet a version of that in the the, the legislative space. But what I think I, my observation is is it raises the bar, or at least raises the baseline for what is acceptable and what is what are, what are the best practices, and just raises and elevates the innovation and technology available. And I, I think actually Congress does have uh, the legislative branch uh, has a number of pockets of uh, technical ex excellence. Uh, you know, I think of. Uh, on, on the House side and the clerk, we definitely have a lot of uh, talent there. Uh, I, uh, I've seen a lot of work out of GPO and, and the Library of Congress that's been really uh, been really excellent over the years. So I think that there are pockets of it. It's really just figuring out how we can expand that. A question up front. 
Thank you for this panel. My name is Lorelai Kelly. I'm at the Beck Center at Georgetown. Um, just to lay out a premise, if we uh, consider um, robust knowledge, uh, deliberation, to be and participation, to be the critical infrastructure of any democracy, um, what we're facing right now is uh, participation and deliberation sort of at war with each other because the deliberative process of Congress is really at risk right now. We've heard some reasons why in districts and the mob town halls, there's no sorting and filtering or curation mechanism inside Congress uh, that works in an integrated way with it that's trustworthy. Um, so my question for you all is like, uh, how do we protect the committees? Because the committees uh, haven't uh, been a mining camp for tech at all or coding or exploration, but they really have to do this deliberative process with robust knowledge. So if you were going to be creating an open standard for the committees of Congress, like how do you, how do you balance these demands on it? Like um, how do you make it more open and participatory but also protect the subject matter expertise? Is it an open format? Is it a set of open standards that one committee creates and then it becomes contagious? Um, the House is a f more innovative and more willing to take risks. I have a feeling that like if we don't figure this out, a place like the Senate is just going to continue to circle the wagons until they go back to flares and messenger pigeons. I guess I guess I have to field that one. I, I don't have all the answers there, but what's what's important, I think, is the the visibility and the transparency to those interactions. And so, what we one of the challenges for what we do at Fairside is we kind of comply with the typical model. And I think there were some folks on the advocacy world here earlier and um, receiving messages of kind of this one to one model, which really obscures the communication and the sentiment. And um, so we service those customers and so we have to kind of pull them as much as we can with folks like yourself you know pushing them on the other side to be a little bit more open and transparent about these things and so I, I think some of your ideas are um, part of the solution it's a matter of just convincing the powers of be to change how they operate and then we can build the technology it's it's available um, it's just a it's just a, sh a mind shift to some degree because I just add the data act is now a powerful tool for Congress to use. It empowers not only them to make decisions about spending, uh, but also just can have enormous amount of um, understanding about how where tax dollars are actually going. So I think that may, I don't know if that's a protective mechanism, but it's definitely an empowering tool for them. I'm not going to comment on that. Go Hoyas. Any more questions from anybody? Was there a question here? Uh, yes. Okay. Thanks. Hi, uh, my name is Greg Kinsella, and I work at a software startup called Quorum. Uh, and we have had our fair share of headaches trying to break into the government contracting space. So I just had a question uh, for all of you, and that's: um, if, if you're a startup, and if you're you're not really willing to allocate the resources for a consultant to help sort of navigate the, the government contracting space. What sort of advice do you have, not only to just start actively bidding on proposals, but also just to understand the lay of the land and sort of gain an idea of the way the space works, the way the processes work, and be able to sort of look through all of the red tape and just start playing a more active role? I'll take a crack at that. Um, so I wouldn't try to do it by yourself. Um, I wouldn't necessarily hire a consultant, but that's a choice that you'd have to make uh, from a business perspective. But I would definitely talk to people who do it. Um, there are a lot of people who have cracked into the space. Uh, there are a lot of people who know what works and what doesn't work. Um, and I'd find, f find a few um, and talk to them about what's working and what's not. I mean, that's the short-term play is to just get, get to talk to other folks who are doing this type of work, find out what's working for them and what's not working for them. Um, ultimately, you know, my, my, my bias here is that I want you, if you're building a great product, build a great product and then you know, hopefully the government will come around and figure out that it has uh, has a use case there. Um, but uh, in in reality, the best way to do is to talk. And there are lots of there are lots of people in, in this town, particularly, who would be willing to to have those conversations with you uh, about how you might think about breaking in. Yeah, I kind of let Dave go first on that one, so he could set the stage. But so I, 
I think there's a couple of things. I think Dave is really right. There's a lot of people who have managed to do this successfully um, here. And so you can reach out and have conversations with them. I think if you talk to anybody in government at any agency, they're going to point you to the SBA, um, which has resources. Um, I, I think that the other place, or there are, I guess, there's a success story that I would share with you that's actually at the SBA, which is there's a team in Baltimore who built a product to identify uh, wow. individuals living in hub zones that were employable under hub zone contracts. And I think they built it about two years ago. And the SBA came to me and they said, we want a product like this one. And I said, well, why don't you buy that one? <laughs> um, so sometimes there is this opportunity, like Dave said, to build something and to go out there and have continuous conversations, knock on doors, call people, bug them endlessly, send emails, do all the things that you have to do in order to get them to listen to you because eventually they will have listened to you enough that when that problem come, comes up, they're going to come and find you. Um, I think one of my personal suggestions, having been on the selling side into government, is um, to really understand the lay of the land in any agency. Like, you need to know who your sales points are. Is it the CIO or is it somebody lower? Have you talked to the contracting office? Have you done all the long list of things that SBA says that you should do? Because you should do them. Um, and to kind of go from there. And Dave is right. I mean, don't do it alone. There are people here that have done it successfully and would be more than willing to help you.